I'm not much of a nature buff, but there's something about standing among those colossal redwood trees that grips you by the soul. Not that I'm the poetic type. Anyway, this all happened a while back when I was visiting Humboldt Redwood State Park. It's up north in California and can be quite the trek from the usual tourist bustle. There's this extraordinary tranquility there. It's a bit like stepping into another world. I've seen pictures, sure, but no picture ever did those trees any justice. What you can't see in pictures is that profound stillness that hangs in the air, only broken by the occasional sigh of the wind through the branches. It's humbling, standing there, dwarfed by these gnarled giants that stretch up into the sky. It seems like they're almost touching the clouds. I remember it was a bright, cool day, with the air smelling of damp earth. Fragments of sunlight pierce through the trees. The awe those trees inspire, it warrants respect and the cool shade those leafy behemoths cast. It made for a nice respite against the afternoon sun. I fancied a quieter hike, preferring the lesser used trails to the more populated ones, where you'd bump into folks every couple of yards. I'd much rather run into squirrels than the weekend warrior crowd. So off I went. It was during one of these solitary treks, off the beaten path, crunching over the thick blanket of pine needles, that I had this eerie encounter. I must have been about half a day's hike in, heading towards a place called Tall Trees Grove. Now if you know your trees, you'd know those towering redwoods can live up to a few thousand years. Talking about some serious old timers here, I appreciate them, the silence, the sense of calm they exude. A guy could lose himself in a place like that, in a good way of course. I was well into the underbrush by then, maybe getting a bit too comfortable in the silence and the raw beauty of it. There was a light filtering down through the trees. The forest was chiming with the soft rustle of leaves and the far-off call of some bird. That's when I heard it, a low rustle different from the movements of the other creatures in the forest. It sounded like there was something big stirring close by. My heart started beating faster, but it did little to muffle that rustling sound that seemed to be growing louder and closer. Gradually, the natural sounds of the forest stilled replaced by an ominous quiet that smothered everything in its presence. My mouth turned dry and I had this strange feeling, something I can't describe. Needless to say, that half day's hike back to safety felt a whole lot longer right about then. I strained my ears to hear something, anything that might clue me in to what was traipsing around out there. I couldn't see anything and hoped it was just a deer rustling in the underbrush, but my gut was saying something different. There was a distinct sensation of being watched, of being hunted. I can't describe it any other way. The eerie quiet continued, broken by my heavy breathing and the pounding of my heart in my chest. It felt like I had trespassed some untold boundary and something was not at all happy about it. And that was when I first saw it. It was a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. There was definitely something out here, an uneasiness coiled at the pit of my stomach whispering warnings that things were about to get dangerous if I stayed there. I spun around, squinting towards the source of movement. The forest was gathered in silence again, the birds and critters themselves seemingly holding their breath in anticipation. Craning my neck, I caught sight of what every instinct of mine was screaming against. There was a pair of yellow eyes glaring from the shaded undergrowth. Its eyes had an unnatural shine to them sort of glowing in a way that froze me on the spot. The enormity of the being attached to those golden glowing eyes is something that I find hard to describe. Standing on two legs, it carried a chilling resemblance to a dinosaur, or maybe a lizard. The way it moved upright was remarkably humanoid, and yet it was very much not. Its head, now that was a sight I won't ever forget. It reminded me of a monitor lizard, and sported a wicked set of sharp teeth. The sight of those teeth paired with the fearsome claws that ended its scaly limbs left a sinking feeling in my belly. I knew then I was in trouble. Big, terrifying trouble. I can't really articulate the fear that encounter triggered in me. I felt acutely aware, in that moment, that this creature, alien to my world, was not to be trifled with. It was the predator here. I was not. With a final glare, it lumbered into the concealing underbrush. The way it moved was strange but silent, 
much too silent for a creature its size. For whatever reason, it had decided to leave me alone. I don't know why, but I was grateful. I felt my knees buckle as I sank onto the ground, shaky breaths echoing in the sudden stillness. I stayed there, frozen. My mind was muddled with terror, confusion, and relief all at once. I mustered every ounce of courage left in me, bolted onto my feet, and retreated from where I had come, half expecting the creature to lunge at me any moment, but it was gone. The forest felt different around me then, the trees no longer familiar, the path stranger, fraught with an unseen danger that was far too real to ignore. I could barely remember my way back as the adrenaline carried me through the untrodden paths and back to the safety of civilization. That experience, it shook me to the core. I've since found myself turning it over in my mind incessantly, wrestling with the reality of what happened. Was it real or just my imagination playing tricks? If it was real, then what was that thing? Days turned into weeks. The memory stayed, gnawing at the edge of my mind. I haven't visited that forest since, nor any other for that matter. I couldn't shake off the eeriness that encounter left within me. Needless to say, the carefree man that entered the forest that day was not the man who walked out. I've been pondering over whether to share this peculiar story for a while now. It's not something I talk about often. It happened a couple of years ago when I'd taken a trip out to Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. That's in Michigan if you're not familiar with the area. I went by myself, which is something I don't normally do, but I wanted some time alone in nature. It had been a particularly stressful few weeks, and I needed some downtime to just relax. Except, that's not what was in store for me that day. I started my day just as any visitor would do in a state park, hiking. It was an ordinary day, or at least appeared to be. Quite sunny, pretty nice, really. The greenery, the natural sounds of the woods, the cool wind, all just perfect to clear up a cluttered mind. The trails in the area were well marked and there weren't many folks around. I was surprised, given how nice of a day it was. Hours trickled by unnoticed. I spotted a few squirrels and deer along the way. Birdsong filled the air. It was just what I needed. However, as dusk settled in, I found myself on a less trodden path. I'm not sure how exactly I got there. If I had accidentally made a wrong turn, or if this was just the route. But the landscape started to get more rugged than I was prepared for. But the beauty of it, this seemingly untouched spot of nature, it was too perfect to feel any regret. Out of nowhere, I caught an odd feeling, creeping up the back of my neck. You know how you get that weird feeling when you can't see anything out of place, but somehow you know you're being watched? Yeah, that one. I suppose the woods felt somewhat silent, quieter than it had been. The chirping birds had receded, and a certain heaviness hung in the air that didn't seem to be present before. Initially, I chalked it up to the wild playing mind games. It was getting dark and there was an undeniable creepiness to the woods at night. Maybe there's nothing out there but the shadows obscured my vision, enough to be worried. If there was anything out there, I likely wouldn't know it. A weird rustling sound then broke the silence, far behind me in the undergrowth. It sounded too heavy to be a small critter. I turned around, peering into the darkness, but I saw nothing. I was spooked. I decided to head back. My way back was plagued by that unsettling feeling of being watched. I swore for a moment that I heard a soft laughter, or maybe a whisper. I know it sounds crazy. It was like the wind was churning out whispers through the trees or something. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew I wanted to get out of there. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I tried to stay calm and told myself that it was just the wind playing tricks on me, nothing else. But what happened next was something straight out of a nightmare. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a fleeting movement in the shadows. Every time I turned to face it, the shadow had vanished. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was toying with me, like how a cat plays with a mouse before it kills it. And then there it was. Standing in the clearing under the moonlight was the silhouette of what looked like a man. He was tall, maybe about seven feet or so, lanky and silent. The sight was jarring in such a remote wilderness setting. I continued staring at the strange person, fear spreading like ice in my veins. 
The silence returned. Only this time it felt loaded. The figure started changing right in front of my eyes, body contorting in impossible ways, until it was no longer a man. The transformation was disturbing, to say the least. It shrunk back into the shadows, and when it emerged again, it had become a wolf-like creature. Its eyes were glowing, or at least seemed to under the moonlight. But the wolf wasn't quite right. If you saw it wandering around the wild, you would recognize it as a wolf, but you would be able to tell something was off about it. You might not be able to pinpoint it, but you would know. The creature was tall and agile. It moved around the clearing before turning to look straight at me. Caught in its gaze, I felt a sudden danger, an all-consuming dread. The wind picked up again, carrying with it a musky and earthy scent, like a rain-soaked forest floor. Then, out of nowhere, it started laughing, laughing that got louder over the mix of rustling leaves and my pounding heartbeat. It was a human-like laughter, chilling me to the bone. I won't lie. I ran. Any bravado evaporated in the face of what looked inexplicably supernatural. I could hear it behind me as I ran, the soft padding on the forest floor closing in on me. But then, just as suddenly, it was gone. And just like that, the stalking, the eerie sounds, everything was gone. There was only me, panting heavily, pushing through the woods to reach safety. I managed to get back to my vehicle though that night's image never quite left me. Every shadow felt like those unnatural eyes watching me, every gust of wind like that laughter mocking me. I questioned my sanity, my decision, the reality of that encounter. It just didn't make sense. No one would have believed me. With time, I tried to convince myself that it was a case of fear-induced hallucination. But, you know what? I know what I saw. It was real. This took place in Roan Mountain State Park, Tennessee. It was back in mid-July a few years ago. Let me pause here for a second and just tell you about Roan Mountain because it is something else. It sways between hauntingly beautiful and deceptively serene. When I was there, it was the middle of summer. It was uncomfortably hot in most places, but at Roan Mountain, the world was different. The air was clean and cool and carried that rich, earthy aroma that was only found in the forest. I'm a programmer by profession, and at times it's like I can almost feel the zeros and ones in my brain mingle with the bustling of city life. So, I decided to drive down to the state park to get away from everything. Just me in a duffel bag of camping gear, craving for some quiet. Upon arrival, I remember being taken aback by how green everything was. I mean, I had seen photos, but they didn't do the park justice, not in the least. I spent the first day hiking around, absorbing as much of the peaceful atmosphere as I could. It felt invigorating, being closed off from the rest of the world. In the evening, I decided to set up camp near one of the hiking trails. For the most part, it was just your typical camping setup. Tent, small fire pit, camping chair, the works. I remember sitting there, the warmth from the fire playing on my face and just listening to the ambient sounds of the wilderness. I must have been sitting that way for hours, just staring blankly into the fire, but this tranquility didn't last long. At some point in the night, I remember peering into the fire and noticing that the flames seemed somehow different. They were devoid of their usual vibrant tones of yellow and orange, and were tinged with an iridescent, almost a teal hue. I struck it down then to maybe some logs still being damp or something along those lines, but could not shake the eeriness from my mind. It was around that same time when things started to go downright bizarre. Just as I was pondering on the strange color of the flames, my senses perked up to an unfamiliar noise, a hum. It sounded almost mechanical in nature and was very much out of place in the quiet wilderness. I couldn't pinpoint its direction. It seemed as if it was coming from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. But I remember freezing up, my gaze locked onto the odd glow of the fire as the hum got louder and more intense. I wasn't exactly a woodsman, but I didn't have to be to know that the buzzing didn't belong to any ordinary beast of the forest. But there was a split gaping second of pure silence before everything around me seemed to change. 
the night sky suddenly had this weird sheen, like it was made of metal. It was like I wasn't on earth anymore, like I was in some sort of diorama. Picking up my flashlight, I scanned the area only for the blinding beam to illuminate nothing. What I felt next is somewhat of a struggle to describe. It was as if time slowed or even stopped completely. My perception of reality was off. I felt a buzz in the back of my head, like a swarm of bees had lodged in my brain. And then the tree line was suddenly bathed in pulsing neon lights. Like you were in downtown Nashville. There was something above me, but the blinding lights obscured it from my vision. All the silence of mere moments ago shattered into a turmoil of amplified insect noises, rustling leaves in that hum, reminiscent of a giant Tesla coil. Stunned, I dropped the flashlight. My rational mind was wrestling with the bizarre situation, but my gut instinct, the primal part of my brain, was screaming one word, run, and run, I did. Dashing away from my campsite, I slid between the trees, the blaring lights flashing intermittently between their thick trunks. I can't say exactly how long I ran, but at some point, the overwhelming noises receded into a murmur, and the lights seemed to dissipate. I dared to look back, only to find nothing. No lights, no sheen on the sky, no alien hum. Perplexed and panting, I stood in the fringe of the strange reality that had momentarily engulfed me. Navigating through the moonlit trail, I finally found my way back to the campsite come morning. My tent was untouched, the fire dwindled down to ashes, and everything was respectably ordinary. As if the spectacle of lights, the mechanical hum, they all just never happened. My experience at Roan Mountain left me with some profound thoughts. I don't want to be that crazy guy talking about aliens, but I don't have another explanation for it. There was something behind those flashing lights in the sky, and it wasn't anything from the natural world. Yeah, maybe it was some strange military craft. But then, explain everything else. How did it turn my campfire blue? And what was that strange metallic sheen coating the sky that night? I think there's something else out there. Maybe people don't want to talk about it, but it's there nonetheless. My personal experience occurred on a beautiful sunny day a few summers ago. My wife Laura and I had decided to take a day to soak up the tranquility of Hawking Hills State Park in Ohio. A chance to head out in nature and hear the birds sing was the perfect escape we were looking for. We mainly planned to hike on the marked trails that day. Maybe do a bit of bird watching. Laura is a fan of anything that has wings and a beak. We'd even lugged along our binoculars and a hefty bird identification book. The later part of the day we had left open for sightseeing and whatever little adventures the park might have in store for us. Arriving there, the park was precisely as we had imagined it. Beautiful. The walk was peaceful, as we heard nothing but the chirps of the birds and the rustling of the leaves. As we started to explore deeper and deeper, we both began to feel a strange sensation. It didn't make sense at first. It was as if the atmosphere had changed, but we couldn't figure out what it was that changed, or where it came from. We knew we were still in Hocking Hills State Park, but it didn't feel like it anymore. Something had changed. This sounds crazy, but we felt like we were being followed. Laura was nervous. I was too, but I could see it more in her. She started glancing around. I remember the tension in her eyes. We decided to continue, thinking maybe the unfamiliar surroundings were playing tricks on us. At some point, we veered too far off what we assumed was the trail. It was further than we initially intended on going, and that's when we first heard it, a distinct, unsettling, low growl. It was deep and throaty and sent our minds racing. That's when I noticed the silence. The wind had died down, and all of a sudden, the birdsong stopped. It was as if everything in the forest had fled, except for us. And then, that growl began to get closer. And as it did, we noticed an awful smell wafting through the dense underbrush. Imagine the smell of a wet dog that had been rolling around in rotten garbage. Now mix that with the scent of stale urine and what I can only describe as the smell of hot, coppery blood. The forest suddenly took on a malevolent air. I can't tell you how badly I wanted to get out of there, but there was no quick way back. 
We were nowhere near our car. I almost dismissed it as a shadow, but there was something moving out there, hiding behind the trees and underbrush. When it decided to show itself, I don't even know how to describe how terrified I was. I had mistaken it for a shadow because it was so dark. The creature's entire body was covered in thick black fur, but the rest of its body was the perplexing part. It appeared to be something that was both man and wolf. Not like a werewolf, I don't think, but rather some dark creature of the woods. A large wolf beast that had learned to stand on two legs. It had broad shoulders and a pronounced hump on its back. The upper body of the creature looked far too muscular to be a natural wolf. There was something else to it. A sliver of sunlight peeked through the shadows, allowing me a better look at its face. A long snout, pointy ears. It was the face of a wolf. It had the eyes of a wolf. If you had seen just the creature's face, you would bet money that you were looking at a wolf. But then you get to its body. It had distinctly human anatomy. The only difference was in the hind legs. They appeared to be a combination of both man and dog. The creature had both knees like a man and hawks like an animal. That garbage and blood scent became unbearable. This must be some sort of monster. Whether it was a hidden species or something out of a mad scientist's lab, I had no idea. But it didn't matter to me in that moment. We needed to get out of there and get out fast. We didn't have weapons on us, not even a pocket knife. And I didn't think the binoculars in the bird identification book would help much. We ran all the way back to the car. And once we got in, we didn't turn back. We didn't talk, merely glancing at each other every now and then. I think we were both in shock. On the ride home, there was a discussion. I remember Laura describing its face, doubling down on the long snout and double set of teeth, an image forever seared into our minds. We shared a silence once the descriptions ended allowing our racing hearts to slow down a bit. I imagine the only reason it didn't kill us that day was that it simply didn't want to. With those hind legs, it must be fast, way faster than either of us could run. Maybe we just accidentally stumbled into its territory and it wanted us to leave. I don't know. I don't even know what it was, where it came from, or how it managed to remain hidden amidst the traffic of a state park. But what I do know is that sometimes those shadows in the dark are just shadows, but sometimes there are creatures lying in wait. Monsters aren't just forgotten myth and legend anymore. They are real, and they could be hiding anywhere. So, it was the summer of 2015, around mid-July, if I remember correctly. My wife Gina and I decided to take a trip upstate to visit Tedagush State Park in Minnesota. We always like getting away from the city bustle and immersing ourselves in nature. That weekend was especially beautiful. The sun was out and the air was filled with this sweet smell that's everywhere in the park. One of the many things we loved about Tedagush was the cool breeze and the tranquility that it brought, completely diffusing all the stress that was weighing down on our spirits. We set up our camp near the lake. It was a perfect spot providing an unobstructed view of the sun, setting over the expansive waters of Lake Superior. It was breathtaking. We spent most of the day hiking the park's iconic trails. Gina has a thing for waterfalls, and Tedagush has plenty. We visited the highest waterfall within Minnesota, and then we had a delightful picnic near yet another waterfall. We spread our blanket and simply took in the serenity of the place as we munched away. One thing we both enjoy doing is bird watching. Both equipped with our binoculars, we located and identified many different birds that day. One of our favorite catches was the bald eagle, even though they are fairly common up here. As the sun was setting, we decided to take a stroll around the lake. It was then we noticed something unusual. The woods were silent, eerily silent. It wasn't the usual silence that envelops the natural world after sunset. It was a different kind of unease. Walking on the path by the lake, I caught a glimpse of something in the corner of my eye. Turning to see what it was, my eyes fell on something that I couldn't quite comprehend. It stood by the edge of the woods, staying far enough away to be shrouded by the growing darkness, but near enough that its massive silhouette was visible. At first glance, I thought it was just another person, but when I looked closer, I knew that it was something else entirely. 
Now, I'm a pretty big guy myself, standing at six feet two, but this thing, it was bigger, much bigger. I could see dark, possibly brown or even black fur covering its body. Or was it hair? I couldn't quite make it out. We looked at each other, Gina and I, and then back at the figure. It hadn't moved an inch, just standing there like an ominous, silent sentinel. The smell of rotten eggs hit us then, strong and nauseating. Did you hear that? Gina's whisper brought my attention to the deep, rumbling growl that seemed to come from the monstrous figure. It was a sound I'd never heard before, and it chilled me to the bone. The figure still hadn't moved, and yet, it seemed somehow more menacing now. Quietly, very quietly, we began to retreat, never taking our eyes off the thing that was hidden in shadows. The growling grew louder, and the smell intensified. We needed to get back to our camp. I knew that much. That thing didn't want us there, and I wasn't about to argue with it. As we backpedaled, our eyes still locked on the figure. The bottom of my boot scraped against something on the ground and I stumbled. The noise was minute, but the stillness of the otherwise serene dusk amplified it. Instantly, the shadows seemed to leap into movement. A large, rugged hand appeared, a hand that could easily have been mistaken for an ape's. Light brown hair covered the arm that extended out of the shadow, and for the first time, we saw a hint of the face from which the growl had emanated. In that instance, up close, the creature wasn't as enigmatic as its silhouette had suggested. I've never seen anything like it. It had a strong, cone-shaped head tucked into these massive shoulders. Features too familiar, and yet different than they should be. It had strong features, but I remember its eyes the most. Eyes that held a spark of curious intelligence. A primal fear gripped us. We were looking at something prehistoric, a primitive man or perhaps the missing link between man and ape on the evolution train. There was a vaguely rank, almost garbage-like smell, much worse than that rotten egg smell surrounding it, making it even more unbearable. Just as suddenly, it let out a loud yelp. It was a guttural, horrifying sound that seemed to make our very bones vibrate. We bolted. Somehow we made it back to camp, but that didn't alleviate our fears in the slightest. In the safety of our tent, feeling the ground still tremble from what we presumed was the creature's movement, we huddled close. Had it followed us? We didn't know and didn't dare look. We spent a sleepless night in the tent, clutching each other, jumping at every rustle and snap. Nothing further happened that night, but when we stepped out of the tent the next morning, our camp was in shambles. Yet, when we explored the site of the encounter, we found no trace. There were no footprints, no evidence of our midnight marauder, nothing at all. We left Tedagush and its haunting memories that very morning. We decided not to report the sighting, knowing how fantastical it would seem. Who would believe we saw Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever that was? We still visit national parks, but we haven't gone back to Tedagush. We can't. At least, not for a while. Over the years, I've told the story to close friends. Some believe, some don't. Even caught a whiff of that same sickening scent a time or two, on other trips. Each time it brought that memory rushing back, and I know now to get out of the area as soon as I smell it. I don't know for certain what we saw. I have my ideas, but they've been ridiculed one too many times. I leave it up to you and your audience to decide what to make of it. After all, truth, as they say, is stranger than fiction. A couple of years ago, I was working as a park ranger at Devil's Lake State Park in Wisconsin. I loved everything about that gig, the early sunrises, the cool evening breezes, the quiet serenity of nature, and even the occasional wild animal that took a shine to me. You could say I was living my dream, until this one incident. It was a day like any other at first, but it turned quickly to an experience I still can't wrap my head around. My day always started at the crack of dawn. I'd patrol the well-used trails, check the animal tracks, pick up litter left behind by disrespectful tourists. You know, the usual stuff. Being out there in the wilderness, living off the whims of nature and doing my bit to keep her beauty intact. There was no place I'd rather be. It was a simple life just me and the great outdoors. One day, 
My routine sugar maple monitoring took me to the brush line off the quartzite trail. It was a regular gig. Examine the trees for any disease, insects, measure the circumferences and all that. This day, however, the second I stepped off the trail, something seemed off. There was this smell, a stench really. All around me the air was thick with it. It was a pungent, heavy odor that I can only describe as a cross between deep earth and rotting garbage. Might not seem that odd in the wild, but it felt different. I would have dismissed it if not for my gut. I've been out in the wilderness long enough to trust my instincts. When nature talks, we should listen. I learned that the hard way, but that's a story for another time. It wasn't the terrible smell that unsettled me as much as the feeling it brought. There was a sense of wrongness, like something had visited that place that didn't belong. It was then I noticed everything was oddly quiet. Devil's Lake isn't a quiet place in my experience. There's always some bird call or rustling leaves, the hum of flowing water or critter scrabbling about. The forest is never really silent, but in that instant, I swear, you could have heard a pin drop. The eerie silence I would have normally welcomed was uncharacteristically chilling. In that tranquility, however, I noticed a faint hum. Now, this is going to sound bizarre, but it was like the low buzz you'd hear around those big, old power lines. But this was the wild miles away from civilization, and there were no power lines around. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to turn back, but the forestry service had its procedures, and I had a job to do. Determined, I hauled my equipment further in, shrugging off these feelings, trying to convince myself it was another day in the park. And that's when I saw them, the trees, they were scarred, some kind of burn marks, all blackened and smoky. But it was just those few trees. None of the others were affected. It was as if something had scorched them. It wasn't like a wildfire. The burn marks were made precisely, methodically, even it wasn't natural. That much was clear. After taking down notes and some pictures of those trees, I looked up at the ridge above, and there, there was something. It was some sort of figure. Human, perhaps or maybe something else. It took me a moment to process, but by the time I did, they were gone. Now, I have no way to prove this and you're welcome to be skeptical. But remember, the wilderness doesn't care for our explanations or lack thereof. I'm not sure what happened that day or what I saw, and I sure don't know if others have experienced it too. But one thing's for certain, there's something else out there besides us. So there I was standing among the damaged trees with that increasingly uncomfortable buzzing in my ears, the kind you'd probably hear if you stood beneath a giant power transformer, which was absurd given that I was way out in the park, miles from any power source. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I started trudging up the forest to the ridge. The stench got worse with each step, not just the rotting garbage smell, but a sulfur-like odor now clung to it. This is where it gets hard to explain. I've always been a creature of instinct, entrusting my life to the silent language of the wilderness many times over. But what happened up at that ridge, I still struggle to comprehend. When I reached the crest, I saw them. They were humanoid shapes of maybe four to six feet tall. They were skinny, with disproportionately large heads and black oval eyes. No noses, no mouths. They were like something straight out of those alien conspiracy theories. There were about a handful of these greys as people call them, stationed around what looked like some sort of metallic object. They seemed to be examining their surroundings silently, telepathically communicating maybe, I don't know, and that hum, it seemed to be emanating from them. Now, I won't lie, every nerve in my body screamed to bolt, but my feet became rooted to the spot, eyes glued to the unsettling spectacle before me. They reeked, the stink mixing with the wood's natural odor, overpowered everything else. I couldn't tell you how long I stood there, staring in abject horror, my heart pounding out a stuttering rhythm against my rib cage. It may have been seconds, or maybe hours, but then one of them turned, its black eyes seeming to look right at me, through me, and the hum intensified. It broke me out of my daze. I bolted. Somehow, don't ask me how, I made it back to my office. I was sweating buckets. My heart was pounding so hard I could feel each beat resonate through me. 
I locked myself in for the rest of the day, trying to convince myself that what I had seen was a figment of my imagination. But the bizarre condition of the trees and the residual humming in my ears told a different story. Once evening fell and the park grew quiet, I found myself replaying the day's events over and over in my mind, my sleep plagued by the image of those creatures and the haunting hum. Had I crossed paths with extraterrestrial life? Or was it some bizarre phenomenon of nature that I had yet to understand? Consequently, I resigned a month later, unable to shake off the lingering fear that came with working in the park. Discussions with other park rangers revealed no similar experiences, and I learned that the trees eventually recuperated from what looked like burn damage. Despite several sleepless nights and an enduring unrest, I consider myself lucky for having escaped unharmed. I'm still uncertain of what happened that day. All I can do is carry the haunting memories of those black, soulless eyes and the unceasing hum, always reminding me that something out there didn't belong to this world. I've been a park ranger at Channel Islands National Park for over 10 years now. The park is located off the coast of Southern California, near Los Angeles. I've amassed a number of strange stories over that time, but this takes the cake. Most of my tales are about strange people or usual wildlife encounters. All of them have some reasonable explanation in the end, except for this one. I try to watch out for the park and all of its inhabitants, human and animal. This happened during a routine patrol. Things took an unusual turn to say the least. It was a fine sunny day to start. That piece of paradise we call the Channel Islands was all shades of greens and blues. And against this backdrop of lush nature, there I was, doing my regular checks. Over the years, I've developed a rhythm for these patrols. I check on the wildlife trails we have tracked and maintain our remote cameras, while soaking in the serenity of the park and its unique landscape. This particular day was no different. The sun was warm, the gulls were loud, and the air was salty. The sea was calm as I patrolled along the remote section of the park. It was peaceful, so damn peaceful, considering what was to come. I remember gazing out at the expanse of the Pacific, watching a container ship in the far distance, and thinking how strange it was that two such worlds existed so close to each other. There was minimal activity in the woods that day, just some deer grazing and squirrels scurrying through the bushes. I was finishing up the day's checks, planning to head back when it happened. I wouldn't say I saw it first, but rather I felt it. A gust of a wind picked up, sending a chill down my spine. It was a cold that didn't belong in the sunny weather. The birds seemed to quieten, and a different form of silence took over. Now you might think I'm exaggerating here, but when you've spent a good portion of your life in the wilderness, you learn to heed these signs from nature. I've always believed that our body speaks a language that's older than words, a primitive form of communication that taps into the instincts we hardly use in the civilized world. And my instincts were blaring sirens. Something was off. I scanned the area for what could have caused the sudden change. That's when I noticed ripples dancing across the otherwise still surface of the water. But they weren't like something caused by wind or a moving boat. It was as if something beneath the water was stirring it. As a seasoned ranger, I'm well versed with the diverse marine life around the islands, but this seemed different. I moved closer to the shoreline, curious and cautious. I saw a shadow in the water, a large one. It wasn't quite identifiable, neither a whale nor a school of seals, the usuals we get around here. There was a strangeness about it, something that unsettled the calm sea. This thing, whatever it was, was huge its shadowy form undulating beneath the clear water. It seemed to glide, smoothly, purposefully. But before I could even make out more, it dived deeper into the sea, away from the coast and my prying eyes. You know the funny thing about such unexpected encounters? One moment, you're the watcher, the observer, the protector, and the next, you're nothing but a confused, curious bystander, trying to make sense of the strange hand you've been dealt. I thought that was the end of the wilderness's odd show, but it felt like the calm before a storm. Out of nowhere, a baffling sound cut through that silence, a bellowing roar. 
thunder-like and guttural, echoed off the surrounding cliff faces. But it wasn't your typical thunder. The sea and the wind carried an undertone of a growl, originating from the depths of the sea itself. This sound was like no marine or terrestrial creature I've come across in my years at the park. If I had to describe it, I'd say it was like the wrath of the ocean and the eternal wild all woven into one strange sound. I couldn't help but move closer, despite the building tension. My curiosity got the best of me. The ocean, which a moment before mirrored a sheet of glass, lashed and thundered, churning with bubbles and waves as if the seafloor was ablaze. It felt like an angry disturbance rippling through the sea's very soul. Suddenly, arcing out of the water, an enormous serpent-like creature rose up from the depths. This was not any known marine animal. It was titanic, easily dwarfing the nearby container ship I mentioned earlier. Outlined against the clear sky, its scale-covered body glistened in the sun. It had broad, fin-like appendages that it used to suspend itself above the waves. Its eyes were eerie, hypnotic even, but not in a gentle way. Rather, they carried an unsettling malice, a malevolent intelligence I've never seen in any animal's eyes before. The brine-filled air grew thick with stench. My nostrils were assaulted with a scent as old and distinct as the ocean itself mingled with something foul. The sheer terror of that sudden reveal made my heart race, but before I could react, with a thunderous thrash of its body, it dove back into the now raging waters, creating a whirlpool so fierce the whole shore trembled. Then, as suddenly as the creature had appeared, it was gone. Some might call it a monster, but I'd say it was just another citizen of the wild that we're yet to understand. In the following days, my thoughts kept drifting back to the encounter. It was like watching the park emerge from a shared dream, with the deer grazing, the foxes playing, the birds singing. Everything slipped back into its harmonic routine, as if the chaos was a forgotten echo. You know the best part about being a ranger? It's the privilege of witnessing nature's obscure tales, told by no humans but shared by the trees, the sea, the soil, and the air. This incident is another of these stories. Living at the edge of civilization brings such encounters, reminding us We've only begun to unravel the mysteries tucked away in this vast, beautiful wilderness. I've got a story for you. This one happened a couple of years ago. I'd recently started dating this girl, Lisa, and decided a picnic would be the perfect date. Living in the heart of Colorado, we had no shortage of beautiful nature spots to choose from. We ended up settling on this picturesque meadow surrounded by towering pines, about an hour outside of Denver. I'd spent the previous day stuffing a cooler with sandwiches, cheeses, and fruits. I tried to go all out. After all, Lisa was a city girl. She'd only just moved to Colorado, and I wanted to show her the relaxation of a laid-back, outdoorsy lifestyle. This meadow was perfect. It was like something you'd see on a postcard. We laid out the red blanket, started unpacking the food, and were having a hell of a good day. The sun was beaming and there was just a hint of breeze. Lisa was laughing at my terrible impressions, and for a while everything was going well. Then, feeling the heat of the day, we both dozed off. I don't know how long we slept, but it was easily close to an hour. I remember being awoken by a sudden coldness, not just the kind of cold from a passing cloud blocking the sun. It felt unnatural electrical almost. I stirred, sat up and rubbed my eyes, and that's when I first noticed it. A figure, lurking at the periphery of the meadow. It was a dark smudge against the vibrant colors. It was hard to make out any specific details from that distance, but something about it put me on edge, and a deep sense of dread clenched around my chest. Was it the way it seemed to hover just at the edge of the forest? The way it seemed somehow both solid and formless at the same time? The thing, whatever it was, stayed in my sight for the better part of an hour. We stayed close to each other on the blanket, whispering about how we were torn between an urge to flee and a weird curiosity that held us rooted to the spot. Admittedly, we were both freaked out but tried passing it off as a bear or some other wildlife. But the sense of unease stayed, 
It didn't help that the figure was unsettlingly manlike, but hazy, almost blurry. It was like looking through frosted glass. Our little relaxing picnic had been tainted by a sense of dread that was hard to shake off, at least as long as that thing was still there. Then began the sounds. Soft at first, a low hum that could easily be dismissed as the hum of insects or distant river, but it began to increase in volume, becoming a guttural, growl-like echo that seemed to resonate from both everywhere and nowhere. The last thing I remember is grabbing Lisa's hand and scrambling to our feet. Our abandoned picnic left as a sad little island of normality in a rapidly changing landscape of fear. Whatever it was, it stayed in my periphery, never allowing me to look at it directly. It was like a smudge in a pair of glasses that you can't ever clean, or a blind spot in your vision field. I remember Lisa muttering a low, scared, what the hell is that? Her voice barely audible over the unsettling growling. The shadow was growing larger. I don't know how, but it was significantly taller than it was a moment ago. And what I'd previously thought to be a trick of perspective appeared eerily like horns protruding awkwardly on its head. I didn't know what to say. All I knew was that we had to get out of there. So with Lisa's hand gripped in mine, so hard it hurt, we began running as fast as we could in the opposite direction. Lisa was sobbing now, terrified, but I didn't look back. I didn't want to see it. I don't know how I knew, but I knew if I looked back, that would be it. With a sense of dread, I could smell it now. A strong scent of sulfur and something burning. By the time we reached the safety of our car, the menacing figure had vanished. We jumped in, and I roared the engine to life. Lisa was shaking as she turned around, her eyes wide as saucers. It's gone, she said. Looking back on that event has never been easy. We'd run away from something we didn't truly understand. We knew what we'd seen wasn't human. It wasn't natural. We had no proof, though. I still can't step foot in that meadow. But you want to know the scariest part? When we got back to my home, we found a black feather. The damn thing followed us home. We never saw that figure again. But the smell, that terrible sulfuric smell, I would get whiffs of it in the house for weeks. It finally faded. But the fear, well, the fear never goes away. I can't prove we met a demon that day, but what else could it be? Remember, not everything is as it seems, and sometimes a beautiful day can turn into your worst nightmare. Stay safe out there. My tale isn't your typical campfire ghost story, nor some elaborate urban legend. It's quite personal. Nothing I'd make up for giggles or internet clout. It was a couple of years back around midsummer. I took a vacation and decided to drive up to this secluded lake in Maine. It was a remote place, hardly any tourists and just the perfect place for me to drop a line and catch some peace of mind along with the occasional trout. I've always been one for the serenity of the great outdoors. Fishing is like a form of meditation for me. I went on this adventure solo, which is something I do from time to time. But day felt different. I'm not usually bothered by the feeling of being alone in the vastness of nature, but I felt truly alone that time. Despite my odd feeling, the day began uneventfully. I arrived at the lake just past dawn and set up camp near the shore with all the right gear, my trusty old fishing rod, a six pack of my favorite beer, my lucky fishing hat. As the sun rose higher, I enjoyed a couple of cold ones and cast my line out into the calm waters. The first couple of hours were incredibly peaceful, with nothing but the call of distant loons and a soft breeze to keep me company. Every so often, I'd reel in a decent-sized trout or two. It was shaping up to be an idyllic day. During lulls between catches, I remember losing myself in the soothing rhythm of the lapping waves against the shore and the scent of fresh water. At times, I thought I smelled something briny, almost salty, but I couldn't figure where it was coming from. It was strange, considering we were miles and miles away from the ocean. As the day wore on, I began to notice unusual movements on the water. Around my bobber, the water churned in odd patterns, like there were underwater currents where there shouldn't be. In the stillness of the lake, those ripples seemed out of place, 
I mean, every fisher knows the typical splash a fish makes. And let me tell you, this wasn't caused by a fish. It was something I've never come across before. Even stranger were the sounds that came with the twilight. The once peaceful symphony of the wilderness was punctuated with an occasional low rumble, like some distant thunder, that seemed to echo from the deepest parts of the lake. And yet, there were no signs of a storm on the horizon. I could have sworn that a gust of an unnaturally cold wind seemed to rise from the surface of the lake. On the first night, I brushed it all off as quirks of the secluded lake, or maybe the beer playing tricks with my senses. But little did I know that these were merely the subtle overtures to an encounter that was nothing short of ominous. The entire experience left me questioning the limits of the natural world. The next morning, a heavy fog blanketed the lake, something fairly typical for Maine. But as the first rays of dawn hinted at another beautiful day, the still water did seem unusually dark. It was as if the lake was reluctant to let go of the night. Regardless, I went about my morning routine setting up my fishing gear while nursing a hot cup of camp coffee. Going by yesterday's plentiful catches, I shrugged off my misgivings and cast my line once more, expecting the gentle tug that indicated a biting trout. But the lake remained oddly still, too still for comfort. Time seemed to slow on that fog-drenched morning. The ever-present breeze was oddly absent, and the surface of the lake lay like a dark, flat mirror. It was then I noticed something stirring beneath the surface. Whatever it was, it was massive. The water rippled in strange patterns. The lake came alive with a low, resonating hum that sent vibrations through the soles of my boots. For a fleeting moment, I saw something, eyes glowing like underwater lanterns, fixing me with their hypnotic gaze. The immense shadow then shifted, causing a sudden swell in the water. With the grace and speed unexpected from a creature of its size, it dove deeper, leaving behind a visible whirlpool. The harsh reality of the situation hit me. I was not alone in this vast, isolated lake. There was a presence, a monstrous creature lurking in its depths, nudging at the edge of my reality. Panic surged through me and froze me in my tracks. Part of me wanted to pack up my gear and flee. The other part, a stupefied witness, was swallowing its fear and staying glued to the very spot. I wanted to see what it was. Eventually, survival instincts won. I grabbed as much of my gear as I could and quickly dismantled my makeshift camp, shoving everything into my car. As I glanced back at the lake, the fog had lifted, but the aura of trepidation hadn't. The lake, once my sanctum of peace, had become a source of nightmares. Driving back home, my mind raced, filled with the image of those glowing eyes and monstrous silhouette. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was in the realm of a large predator. Later, hearing tales from other anglers, my chilling experience found me in company. Other people had seen this creature that inhabits this remote, seemingly serene lake. A charming summer getaway had turned into a visceral reminder of an unknown world, lurking beneath the tranquil facade of nature. Since then, I've kept my distance from the lake. Whenever I muster up the strength to revisit my memory, I'm left with a sense of foreboding. Despite the fear, though, there's a part of me, a stubborn fisherman part, that considers going back. Maybe one day I will. So, this happened about five years ago. The wife and I were out on one of our late night drives. You know those types where you're just cruising along quiet roads where nobody else seems to be around? It was sort of our thing, to forget everyday life and just spend some time alone. It was peaceful, with the radio humming old tunes. The locations we went to were pretty remote. I can't exactly recall the name of the places we were offhand. We were just driving aimlessly. The road stretched on for ages, surrounded by dense woods on either side. I guess that's why we loved it, though the feeling of being in a world of our own. We loved pointing out random things to each other and wondering what the people were doing inside their houses. By the way, if you've been married as long as I have, you'll understand that these little shared moments are precious. It was an unspoken agreement, a ritual that we always looked forward to. The dusk had already given way to a clear and starry night by the time we started out on our drive. 
The moon hung high. I would even go as far as to say that it was the perfect night, right up until it wasn't. We were approaching a sharp bend when I first noticed it. An acrid, pungent stench. You expect to smell damp earth, leaves, maybe a skunk if you're unlucky. But this was different. It was putrid. My wife noticed my discomfort and made a face, quickly rolling up her window. Now listen to me. As someone who's practically lived half his life in the woods, I've come across various kinds of smells. But this, this was something else entirely. Something wrong. And let me tell you, nothing good comes from that kind of smell. Just around the bend, I slowed down, trying to make sense of the rancid odor invading our peaceful night. Then we heard it, a guttural growl that seemed to reverberate in the still of the night. It was loud enough to hear over the sound of the truck's engine. My wife looked at me, her eyes wide, and honestly, I was probably mirroring her expression. The odd part was that whatever this creature was, it wasn't afraid of the truck or the headlights or my honking or even my shouting at it to leave the damn road. I noticed a pair of glowing yellow eyes stare back from within the shadows that the pickup's headlights were reflecting. They were higher than what you'd expect from any four-legged forest animal. Maybe a bear standing on its hind legs? But I knew that couldn't be it. The instinctive chill of fear ran down my spine. God, you won't believe what it was that we saw next. The eyes started to move, sort of bouncing up and down, as if it was attached to something walking. We were transfixed. A silhouette appeared from the shadows, backlit by the glow of our headlights. Right then, the wife let out a terrified gasp beside me. The figure had an enormous width, broader than any man I'd ever seen. That wasn't what made it eerie, though. It was the shape that was downright freakish. The creature, it was like a dog, but it was standing upright. Its muscular arms hung down the sides, ending in what appeared to be elongated feet with noticeable claws that scraped across the blacktop. Its hunched back and powerful thighs only added to its beastly and grotesque silhouette. And oh God, the face, a long snout or muzzle, like a dog's elongated mouth, with yellow glowing eyes that glinted with a terrifying intelligence. It was watching us as we were watching it. I swear I could see drool dripping from its gnashing jaws. Seeing it walk, it seemed like it was hunched over, but stood upright nonetheless. Its legs were oddly similar to that of a canine, if dogs were designed to walk like men. I felt like I was in a nightmare. The creature was covered all over with tufts of thick fur, patches of it sticking out in some places more than others. Its hide was somewhere between black and dark brown, harder to discern with the dim glow from the pickup's headlights. My wife whispered, her words stuck, barely able to pass her trembling lips. Drive, drive now. But my hands were glued to the steering wheel. My eyes remained locked on the monstrosity, slowly trudging across the road, indifferent to our car or even to the high beam pointed directly at it. I'm not sure how long we were sat there. Time seemed to have broken. Finally, the creature disappeared into the dense tree line, leaving behind the acrid stench and a sight that both of us would never be able to forget, or explain for that matter. We drove home that night, but silence swallowed the remaining duration of the journey. We fought to make sense of what we had seen back there, on the lonely country road, but neither of us had answers. In the subsequent weeks, I'd revisited that turn multiple times, but found nothing. We were never the same after that night. Every unseen pair of glowing eyes on the road at night, every unexplained movement in the woods, they all served as dreadful reminders of our encounter with that insane creature. It was also the night that our peaceful drives lost their tranquility forever. Hi Donovan, let me first start off by saying I love the show. I really liked the episode about that warehouse worker who was attacked by some creature you released a few months ago. I've got a very interesting story for you, and a picture that, well, no one can explain. Well, at least no one that I used to work with. I work for an outfit that did government contract work. We work with all branches of the military but specialized in running mock scenarios for special forces. Now, I can't get into too many details, but my job was security. 
I was the head of security for our facility located in Northern Virginia. We basically paid and trained civilians to be part of different training exercises for the military, such as hostage situations. That was a smaller part of our business, and we also had two other divisions. Under our facility was a fallout shelter. That's where this story takes place. Our facility has been around since the 50s, and the shelter really isn't supposed to be used anymore, since there are other shelters nearby. However, we still monitor the shelter as part of our security protocol. I had a few techs who monitored the entire facility. We had a little over 300 security cameras throughout the building in the outdoor areas. There were five placed in various spots in the shelter, too. This took place in August of 2005, where one of my techs noticed something strange going on with one of the shelter cams in the east wing. It would fizzle out like an old VHS tape with tracking issues at the same time every night at 3.13 a.m. This happened three nights in a row. It would last for a few minutes, then the camera would come back online and was perfectly fine. After the third night, we replaced the camera. Now, the camera down there was antiquated, but there wasn't anything wrong with it from what my tech could tell. So, we replaced it with a new one, and sure enough, the same thing happens at 3.13 a.m. But this time, at 3.12 and 59 seconds, we see this right before it glitches out again. So, my tech brought that to me the next morning when I returned to work. I was coming in and he's waiting for me because he had stayed late after his shift ended to show me this. My jaw dropped when I saw it. We had the shelter locked down. There's only a handful of people who could ever access it. And I can tell you that none of them were down there at 3.13 a.m. in the morning. What you see in the picture, it appears to be a man or something human-like that is coming up from one of the corridors into an area that splits off. The cage there is designed to protect an electrical box. The photo is actually zoomed in pretty far. I couldn't send the original because it has some identifying information on it, and I'm not at liberty to share those details. Anyways, I have no idea what or who this thing was. My tech didn't even see it at first because it just appeared for literally one second, and then the tape goes all fuzzy and starts to glitch. He had to rewind it to go through it frame by frame to see it. Like I said, no one has access to this area. This ended up happening every night for the next week or so, and then it just stopped happening. We checked a facility every night, and there was no evidence of this thing being down there. No doors were breached. It's something that no one was ever able to explain. We always referred to him as the boogeyman after that. It's super creepy. I hope your audience enjoys this. Take care. Hey there, Donovan. I had a really strange experience a few weeks ago that I want to share. I told a few of my friends about it, but they just laughed at me and said I imagined the entire thing. I was rambling around Cades Cove in Tennessee, and I finally found this really cool cemetery with a lot of old headstones. I'm kind of a cemetery nut. I used to do a lot of charcoal rubbings. I find the designs on the old headstones so interesting, much more so than the modern stones. I had wandered around for a while. I guess I had gotten turned around. It was time for me to head back out to the valley, since I had a three-hour journey ahead of me, but I couldn't find the gate where I had come in. After about 20 minutes of following paths, only to come up against yet another wrought iron fence, I was pretty irritated with myself. I started looking for another person to ask them where the gate was, but there wasn't anyone else there but me. I hadn't noticed it until I had to think about it. But the whole time that I was in there, I hadn't seen another soul. Now, I'm not the kind to usually get spooked out, but I was starting to feel a little apprehensive. It felt like I was trapped in there. I pulled out my phone, thinking I could pull up Google Maps, you know, that app that can show you walking directions as well as your car, but I couldn't get my phone to turn on. That's when I got really impatient with myself, thinking that I'd let my phone die. And the worst thing was, 
I needed Google Maps to get myself out of Cade's Cove. I was going to have to stop somewhere and ask for directions, and I hate doing that. I was seriously starting to think about hopping the fence. And then I noticed all the vines and wild roses, I guess, all winding through the fence, which means I'd most certainly get scratched up. I remember thinking, okay, that's weird. I didn't notice that before. And I started looking around, really looking now at my surroundings. There were fresh flowers on a number of graves. That was another detail that I was sure I hadn't seen before. When I got there, I had the impression it was just an old forgotten cemetery. But obviously, someone still visited and put flowers on graves. It was then that I noticed a person some distance away, standing in front of one of the graves. I couldn't tell from where I stood if it was a man or a woman. All I could see was that it was a person dressed in all black, which made me hesitate to call out. Like someone might be grieving, you know? I walked over there and waited, a respectful distance behind the figure. Now that I was close up, I could see that it was a woman, in a long black dress and a hat like older women wear to church. I stayed silent, just waiting, figuring eventually she'd turn around, and I could ask her which direction the gate was in. She eventually turned around, and I was a little taken aback. The hat had a black veil that completely obscured her face. It was a little unsettling, because I was unprepared. I couldn't even tell if she was looking at me. I said, excuse me, ma'am, I've got myself turned around. Could you please point me in the direction of the entrance? She didn't answer, but she started walking toward me, closing the distance. I wondered if her silence meant that she thought I was rude to having disturbed her. Since she was obviously in mourning, I quickly said, I don't mean to bother you. No response, but she kept moving toward me until she was so close I had to take a quick step back. But she kept coming. Suddenly, I know this part sounds crazy. She wasn't in front of me anymore. I mean, completely vanished. I even turned around to see if she was anywhere in sight. But she was gone. I got chills all over. She looked real to me. But I wondered if I just imagined her. And then I thought, who imagined something like that? A person that's not there. Which got me wondering if I had schizophrenia or a brain tumor or something. Don't laugh. These thoughts really went through my head. And it was a terrifying prospect to think of. Then I looked back at the grave she had been standing in front of. It looked freshly dug. And there were flowers at the base that I assumed the lady had brought with her. White daisies bound with a red ribbon. I looked at the headstone and that's when I really freaked out. I started to feel dizzy. The stone said Jonathan Wilkes, 1838 to 1889. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I closed my eyes for a minute and opened them back up. It was still there. And the headstone had one of those cool skull engravings that you see on old graves. Except this stone looked new. At that point, I thought, okay, this is some prank someone is playing. That was the only explanation. I looked around to see if I could spot someone hiding, watching me, or maybe even recording me. If there was someone there, they were doing a good job hiding. I even called out, very funny, but obviously fake, and waited. But no one came out of hiding. So I thought about the woman, and I figured finding her was the only way to keep my sanity. She couldn't have gone far. I walked around, following the path to the center of the cemetery. Since it was on a slight rise, I figured I'd be able to better spot her if I stood there. I'm walking along going up the hill and looking around, and everything seems different. It took me a second to figure out why. Then I realized there were no fresh flowers on any of the graves. And also, what I could see of the fence from where I stood was completely bare. No wild roses or vines. I literally got chills running down my spine. This looked like a different cemetery. I started moving quicker, close to panicking. Only one thought was in my head. I needed to get out of here right now. So I went to the nearest fence and climbed over, rather awkwardly, but still happy to be outside the grounds. Then I bushwhacked a little, heading downhill, and eventually found the road. 
Ten minutes later, I was in my car and glad to put that weird graveyard behind me. I got to the crossroads and automatically grabbed from my phone before remembering it was dead. But the screen lit up. It said there was a 35% charge left. Add that to all the weirdness, and I couldn't get out of the area fast enough. When I got back, I told some of my buddies about it. They all laughed and said, I imagined the woman, the flowers, and the phone being dead. Then, one of my friends who's familiar with the area got real interested, saying that he'd never seen a cemetery on that road. So, in an effort to get someone to believe me, I agreed to go back with him a few weekends later. We drove up and down that road and all over the area, but we couldn't find that graveyard. I swear it was on that road, but suddenly, it's gone. I'm seriously considering having a CT scan to make sure there's nothing wrong with my brain. Has anyone out there ever experienced anything like that before? I think somehow I stepped back in time, as crazy as that sounds. Thanks for listening, Rick. I used to think stories like these were pretty limited to just a few spots with very low population density. But it's starting to sound like these things really don't care how many people are around. As a park ranger, I've worked in quite a variety of places. I'd never seen something that I couldn't explain, though. When I saw this creature I'm going to tell you about, I was living in Texas. It was about five years ago, and I was working as a park ranger in Big Bend National Park. I would sometimes do talks and presentations for visitors. It was one of my favorite parts of working in that field. Big Bend has a great history. It has mixed high desert and smaller mountains. It's just a gorgeous place. It's in the western part of Texas that goes downward along the bend of the Rio Grande on the border of Mexico. It was early in the summer and I was preparing for a backpacking series presentation. I needed to get some pictures and I decided to hike out near the area around Santa Elena Canyon. That part of the park opens up into a pretty flat area of the basin where the river gets real wide. It was in the late afternoon. I like to get those golden hour photos. There tends to be a lot more diverse wildlife around there. I'd parked my truck a distance away in a lot that serviced the trailhead. I had spent plenty of time there in the past. I was approaching the river basin near the mouth of the canyon when I saw something that looked unusual. Something was moving on the other side of the river, and it was big. My brain was scrambling, trying to figure out what category of creature it was. At first, I thought, a mountain lion? But I knew instinctively that it wasn't. It was the size of a large man, but it was moving along really low to the ground. It was like a dark tan color, and it really struck me because of the way it was moving. It was like it had a bulk similar to a deer or something, but it was moving like a snake. Obviously, big mammals don't move like that so I just kept staring at it, trying to make it out better. I kept moving back and forth, trying to get a good line of sight on it, and when I finally got a pretty clear view, I felt like my blood froze. I couldn't even identify what it was. It was very scrawny looking and really pale. It looked hairless and very humanoid, but it was creeping along low to the ground. I got the impression that it was hunting something. I could have probably thrown a rock across the water and hit it. It seemed to be totally focused on something off in the bushes. I stayed completely still so that I wouldn't make any noise. But then, it turned its head and looked at me. It had these huge black eyes, and the mouth was hanging open in this creepy way. When it saw that I had seen it, it hunkered down even lower and seemed to scoot back trying to hide. I managed to take a few photos, but I was so frozen in fear. All I could think about was surviving. I've never been so thankful for a river in my life, even though the river was pretty low at that time due to a drought. I'm sure there were some points that could be crossed without too much trouble, but it was still quite wide, and at least it provided a psychological safety barrier. The thing started to swivel its head back and forth, like it was looking between me and its original prey. I felt like it was sizing me up and trying to decide if I was worth the risk of hunting down. My heart was pounding, but I maintained my forward-facing direction. I started to slowly back away. 
Then its gaze fixated on me, and it started making this weird clicking noise. I was terrified that it had chosen me to be its dinner that night. I'll never forget that part, just waiting for it to decide which direction it was going to choose. I don't know if it decided I wasn't worth it or if the river was just too much of a barrier or what, but I could feel that moment when it almost seemed to lose interest in me and it went back to stalking whatever was over there hiding in the bushes. I was able to get back to the truck without feeling I was being pursued, but it still felt like one of the longest walks I'd ever taken, even though it wasn't really that far. When I got back to my truck, I didn't even leave right away. I felt like I just wanted to stay there and watch out my window, in case it had decided to follow me. My brain was desperate to know what it was. I was honestly wishing it would reappear at that point, so I could try to get some pictures of it from the safety of my truck. I always remembered being parked there, listening to the occasional sounds of the typical wildlife that I was used to hearing. I stayed until it got completely dark, but I never saw a sign of anything out of the ordinary. I reported the sighting, but it probably sounded like gibberish, and my photos were crap. I'm pretty sure I was shaking like a leaf when I took them. I never saw something like that again, but it took a long time before I felt at all comfortable out there. That thing looked like something out of a nightmare. Hi, Donovan. It took me a while to decide to send this in to you. I've always been skeptical of people who claim to have seen extraterrestrial things. So when I had this sighting, it made me feel so excited. I kind of felt foolish. I was not expecting it at all. I know there are some people who are looking for these kind of experiences and actually take steps to search them out. But I think it's more likely to happen when you're totally not thinking about it. I never mentioned it to my boss or my coworkers. I didn't want to be labeled as a kook, but I know when you guys read things on air, you don't use names, so I'm sending it in. The state park I work for is really one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been. It has a nice mix of beaches and trails, and you couldn't ask for a better environment to work in. It's the Emerald State Bay Park in Lake Tahoe. I don't even know if I should say the name. I wonder if that makes people flock to the area. This place already does get really crowded. I've been a park ranger for quite a few years, and this is the busiest place that I've ever worked. This experience I had happened in 2019. I had spent some summers out here with my family when I was a kid. My dad really liked to rent a boat and hang out on the water all day. So, I loved this place for a long time. We would kind of alternate between here and Lake Havasu for our summer vacations. I never thought I would end up being employed here, though. During summer holidays, the place can be a madhouse. I was on duty on the 4th of July that year, and it was a really crazy day with all those people. After my shift, I decided to go up to Inspiration Point to take in the fireworks show. Lake Tahoe puts on one of the best shows in the country, if you ask me. I got myself some snacks and found myself a good spot to relax. I knew all the little secret areas, so I wasn't near any people. The show started off as usual and was fabulous. About halfway into it, I was looking off to the west a bit, and I saw several orange orbs start to float up toward the sky. I remember thinking something like, Those must be some sort of those Chinese lanterns. Then, as I was watching them, I thought maybe they were embers from the fireworks or something. But they were incredibly bright, so that didn't really make sense since the embers would be fading. They floated up, and they seemed to form into kind of a W shape. They started to look like they were remote-controlled or something. At first, they had looked like bright orange lights. But once they were up high, they looked brighter and whiter and started moving around. Then, they kept going higher and started looking like stars. They obviously weren't embers. But then, soared out of the middle of that W shape, 
there was this craft, or whatever you want to call it, that zoomed down lower and flew over my head. It was too fast for my eyes to really catch what shape it was, like fast as a bullet. It was still pretty high up there, but the lights on it were brighter than anything I've ever seen. And right after it passed over, there were like these little twinkles of light all in the sky right over my head. Like, right over my head. Not over the lake where the show was happening. The twinkles of light started making these incredible light streaks. I was beside myself. It wasn't like any technology that I had seen before. It sounds a little crazy that I had noticed this stuff while that amazing show was going on. Maybe it was because I was used to scanning the sky almost every night. The lights were behaving in this strange fashion. I can't quite explain it, but somehow those twinkles of light suddenly burst into dozens of lights in the sky. All of a sudden, they were moving together en masse, like some kind of squadron or something. It made me feel kind of anxious. But for some reason, I was also filled with this strange exhilaration. I just sat there in amazement, unable to comprehend what I was seeing, but knowing it wasn't normal. You could see the stars steady behind them as they were moving across. Then, the dozens of lights came together and went into a triangle formation, whereas before, they were just individually flying forward. Once they formed the triangle, I noticed that they were flying left to right, up and down. It was really surreal to have this amazing fireworks show going on. And there I was, completely ignoring it, and watching this inexplicable sideshow. It wasn't that high in the sky, but not unnaturally low either. But eventually, the triangle seemed to just start ascending higher and higher, until I couldn't see the lights anymore. I have never seen anything like what I saw before that night. For the next few months, I kept watching the sky, trying to take notice of anything strange. But I never saw anything on that grand of a scale again. I'm sure people must think that what I was seeing was part of the show, but it absolutely was not that. I know there's some military activity not too far from here, so I don't know if it could have been connected to some testing or something like that. But... I really don't think so. Anyway, I really appreciate the chance to share this here. I'd like to see something like that again. But now that I'm looking for it, it probably won't happen. It had been a long day, and a particularly weird one at that. Things at work kept seemingly disappearing, and then showing up in odd places. My computer screen kept flickering on and off. And twice I lost work before I could save it. The last thing of the day was an electric pencil sharpener not working for me. On top of that, I just felt drained. My energy level was just non-existent all day. In fact, all week. I would wake up in the middle of the night. I don't know why, but there was this feeling I kept having. I can't really explain it. I know that sounds odd, but I just can't bring it to words. Maybe dread was the closest I could relate it to. Maybe that's too cliche. I don't know. People had begun to notice how tired I was looking. Dark rings around my eyes. Eyes that were more often than not bloodshot. I'd forget things. I'd lose my temper at odd times. I was a mess, really. After work, I came home and just dropped onto the couch. I didn't have any energy to do anything, really. I turned on the TV and flipped through the channels. I didn't even have the energy for that. I just left it on something and then I began to drift off, I guess. I don't really remember. That's when it happened. I was just lying on the couch. I remember opening my eyes and feeling strange all of a sudden. My arms had goosebumps and I had a feeling of slight panic. I tried to get up, but I couldn't. I couldn't really explain why. My body just wouldn't move for me. Suddenly, it felt like there were hands on my shoulders. And something was holding me down. I tried to move. I remember I kicked my legs a little. But this force just held me down. 
It felt like fingers digging into my shoulders, and I couldn't catch my breath. I swore for a second I saw the outline of a face. Not details or anything. Just the faint outline of a face, like these deep sunk eyes, sunken cheeks, and a mouth wide open, like it was inhaling something over me. I couldn't catch my breath. I started to really panic, and that made me move more. I started moving my shoulders and my arms, trying to push whatever it was that was on top of me. I could feel it holding me, but I couldn't feel it when I kicked up towards where it should be. Suddenly, it let go of me, and I jumped off the couch. The door to the room slammed shut. I can't explain it, but then I felt alone. I was covered in this cold sweat. I was feeling dizzy. I started to walk towards the kitchen when the TV suddenly shut off, then turned on again, the volume turning up higher and higher. I covered my ears with my hands and tried desperately to turn it down with the remote. The TV just turned off. It felt like something knocked me over. I fell to the floor and I could swear something jumped on me, pinning me down. I had this huge pressure on my chest, so much so that I couldn't breathe. I tried to get up to call out, but I couldn't. Then the room began to spin and everything went dark. That's when I woke up three hours later. I got my keys and ran out the door for my car. I didn't know what else to do, so I drove to the hospital. Apparently, I looked pretty bad because they took me in immediately and hooked me up to fluids and had me in a bed. Three bags of saline and 48 hours of uninterrupted sleep, and I could feel somewhat normal again. The doctors and nurses asked what happened to me. What could I tell them? I didn't know what to say. After hours of not saying anything, that's when they had the psychiatrist come in. My story came to me immediately when that happened. It was work. I wasn't sleeping. I was overworking myself, and I was consuming too much caffeine. I tried to make it sound as normal as possible. I don't know if the doctor believed me or not. They kept me for another three days, though. When I was released, it took me a long time to go home. I drove around for a while. Went to a restaurant to eat, but I eventually made my way home. I sat there in my driveway, my hands clenched on the steering wheel, and I saw something in my house. I saw it move past the curtains. This dark silhouette that suddenly dropped out of sight. I tried to take a picture, but nothing came out on my camera phone. I left right after that. I drove 12 hours to my parents' house in Tennessee. I didn't know what else to do. I told them everything, the entire story, and prayed that I didn't sound like a crazy person. I must have, though, because my father, well, I don't really know what he thought. My mother seemed to believe me, and I stayed at my parents' house for a few weeks. That was that. I was moving immediately. I don't know what happened, but I wasn't staying in that house. As soon as I could, I had it up for sale and got my stuff out as fast as possible. We moved out during the day, and I spent as little time as possible in there. Things happened to the movers and my parents as well. Things would disappear in the house. The movers felt uncomfortable, but maybe that was because they kept seeing me. I'm sure I couldn't hide my fear as well as I should have. I moved back in with my parents after that, but I keep track of the house. Eventually, it went to a married couple. Months went by and nothing seemed to happen. I still have nightmares. I still can't sleep at night that well. I don't know what happened. I can't really explain it. Nothing like that has happened to me since. And I pray that it doesn't happen again. I never believed in weird or strange stories before. I'd always say that people were making it up or something. That was until something weird happened to me. That changed my life. Now I can't help but to think there's some truth in everything people encounter. Details might not be clear or whatever, but it doesn't mean it didn't actually happen. I was riding the train into Chicago. It's a great experience, it really is. And it shows you how people used to travel back before the invention of cars. People make fun of me for how much longer it takes, but... It's just the experience of it. There's always a few interesting people on the train as well. 
I spent many hours drawing the different people sitting on the train. It's a great exercise for anyone who's into the arts, and great practice drawing people in motion, learning anatomy. I also like to look out the window at the different stops the train makes. During one of these stops, I was looking out the window, kind of daydreaming and not really paying attention to anything. Something or someone moved and caught my eye, and I turned my head to see this girl. She was alone. No one was standing around her. Her back was turned to me with this long blonde hair that almost reached the small of her back. I didn't really think anything of it, and the train eventually went on its way. I began doodling, not really drawing anything, just making shapes and scribbles. Two stops later, I swear I see that same girl. Long blonde hair, arms wrapped around a book held to her chest, standing there alone. This time, she turns her head slowly and looks right at me. Her eyes are solid black, shiny, almost like precious stones. Her face was expressionless, and she just stared at me until the train started up again. I thought maybe I didn't get enough sleep. Maybe I saw it wrong, or I was just imagining it because I had been daydreaming on and off. Like when you get super bored sometimes, and you swear you saw something this way, or you picked up something from the store, but you actually didn't. I just kept telling myself that until we made the next stop. She was there again. This time people were walking past her. But it seemed like they didn't notice she was there. She looked right at me, eyes big and black. But it almost seemed like she was looking through me. This time she got on the train. I panicked a little, dropping my pencil, my hand shaking a little. I bent down to get my pencil from the floor, then just waited. Something told me she would end up in my train car. I sat in my seat waiting, sweating, my hands shaking every time I tried to draw. I looked around from time to time, but I didn't see the girl. I just stared out the window, trying to take my mind off what I had seen. I started to calm myself down a bit. An hour went by without me really noticing. I don't know why, but I began to look around at the people sitting around me. Far off at the opposite end from where I was sitting, I saw the top of a blonde head. The hair looked like it was straight. It looked like it could be that girl that I had seen at the other stops with the black eyes. I closed my sketchbook. I slid the pen into the metal rings that bound it and just started tapping my foot. Panic began to swell up inside me. Looking out the window wasn't working anymore, so I got up to find the restroom. When I walked back to my seat, she wasn't there anymore. The blonde head wasn't in the seat that I saw her in. I sat back down in my own seat and kept looking over from time to time. A half an hour went by and she didn't return. Then an hour, she still wasn't in that seat. Was my mind playing tricks on me? Was she even really there at all? Time seemed to fly by. Eventually, we made our way into Chicago. When I got up from my seat, I could have sworn someone touched my hair. I looked around, but there was no one near me enough to do that. I kept my eyes open as we got off the train, and as I made my way through the station, I called an Uber to bring me to my friend's house in Canaryville. I didn't have to wait long for the Uber, but I kept looking around trying to see that girl again. The Uber driver made small talk. He was a nice enough guy, but I just wanted to get to my friend's house as fast as possible. I still couldn't wrap my head around what had happened on that train. I looked out the window as Chicago passed by, taking in the city and the people. We get to my friend's and I pay the Uber. I get out of the car and I feel this cold chill run down my spine. I turn around and there she is across the street, her black eyes staring straight at me and her blonde hair blowing in the wind. I run up to my friend's door and knock as fast as I can. He pulls it open. I almost jump inside his house. I point across the street and tell him what happened on the train. He starts laughing, but he looks across the street, and his face turns white. He sees her standing there. His mouth almost drops to the floor. She turns her head and nods towards us, then just disappears when a car drives by. We both lose it and we go out of the house looking around for her. The neighbors are looking at us like we're insane. 
My friend goes and asks if anyone saw the girl standing across the street. One of them did, but didn't understand why we were acting so crazy. We stayed up all night talking about it with some of our other friends. We kept looking outside, waiting to see if this girl would show up again across the street. As a Yellowstone Park Ranger, I was often out on routine hikes as part of my job duties. These hikes were meant to help me familiarize myself with the park's trails and to keep an eye out for any potential hazards or issues that might need to be addressed. It was also an opportunity for me to observe and interact with the park's wildlife, as well as educate visitors about the importance of preserving and protecting the natural environment. On this particular day, I was out on a routine hike because it was part of my regular patrol schedule. I was walking along this narrow trail that led through a dense forest when I heard this rustling in the underbrush. I stopped and listened carefully, trying to determine what was causing that noise. It sounded like it was getting closer, so I slowly reached for my bear spray just in case. Suddenly, a massive creature burst out of the trees and onto the trail in front of me. It was a wolf, but unlike any wolf I'd ever seen before. This wolf was standing on two legs like a human and towering over me. It had this dark brown fur that was shining in the sunlight. Its eyes were piercing and they looked intelligent. Its jaws were strong and powerful, filled with sharp teeth that were bared in a snarl. Its claws were extended, ready to attack, and it seemed to be sizing me up, as if it was trying to decide whether or not to attack. Overall, the wolf had this intimidating and aggressive presence, and I could tell that it was a formidable predator. I froze, unsure what to do. The wolf seemed to be sizing me up. Its eyes narrowed and its lips pulled back in a snarl. It was clearly agitated. I could see that it was ready to attack. I slowly backed away, trying to keep my distance from the wolf. But it was no use. It was too fast. It just lunged at me. Its sharp teeth bared and its claws extended. I tried to fend it off with my bear spray, but the wolf was too strong. It knocked me to the ground and began to bite and claw at me, determined to bring me down. I fought for my life trying to escape from the wolf's grasp, but it was no use. It was just too powerful. I was certain it was going to kill me, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Just when I thought it was all over, the wolf suddenly stopped attacking. It looked right at me with its piercing gaze, then turned off and ran into the forest disappearing into the trees. I lay there on the ground, battered and bruised, but somehow alive. Honestly, it was a miracle that I had survived that encounter. I was eventually rescued by a team of rangers and rushed to the hospital, where I was treated for my injuries. The bite marks were deep and numerous, and it was clear that I had been attacked by a large predatory animal. But when I tried to tell the authorities about the strange bipedal wolf that attacked me, they dismissed my claim and insisted that it must have been a gray wolf or a bear. They even went so far as to cover up the incident, pretending that it never happened. I knew that what I had seen was real and that the authorities were just trying to protect the reputation of the park. But I also couldn't prove it and that I would have to live with the memory of that terrifying encounter for the rest of my life. I've thought about that moment many times since that day, and I have a few theories about why that wolf might have stopped attacking me. One possibility is that the wolf just simply lost interest in attacking me. It may have been agitated or provoked by something else, and my presence may have simply been a coincidence. Once it had satisfied its aggression, it may have just simply lost interest in me and decided to move on. Another possibility is that wolf was startled by something else. It may have heard or seen something that caused it to become distracted or frightened, and it may have decided to run away rather than continuing to attack me. Ultimately, I'll never know for certain why it stopped attacking me. It was an extraordinary and unexpected moment, and one that I'll always remember. Hi Donovan, I'm very excited to be writing in as a 5th generation rancher. 
who is also a fifth-generation skinwalker witness. My family has ranched out of New Mexico, and I've got five skinwalker sightings to tell you about. In 2020, I was moving cattle from New Mexico to Texas after selling part of my herd. I had one cow that was just refusing to be caught, so I went with an unconventional method of catching her. I decided to wait till she was asleep and sneak up on her with a rope. It was a little past midnight on August 4th, and I was heading out into the pasture on my ATV hunting her down. I found her asleep and standing up near the watering hole, so I parked the ATV so I could walk up on her with less noise. Just as I was getting close, though, I heard something pounding in the dirt behind me. I turned and looked, and there it was. I could only really see it by the light of the moon, but it looked like a human twisted around walking on all fours with its knees pointed backwards. It looked at me with these glowing eyes and I jumped back, startled at the sight. I took off on foot back to my four-wheeler. I figured I'd find another way to catch the old cow. I wasn't going to spend another minute out there with that thing. The whole way out of the pasture, I could see it in my peripherals running alongside me. Fortunately, I finally did manage to get away. But when we went out after the cow the next morning, She'd been just about picked clean. All that was left were her bones, laid out bleaching in the summer sun. My mom saw the same thing on the property back in 1979. She had retired from barrel racing in the rodeo, but still enjoyed working horses, and was out running one she just broke through that same field one evening when the skinwalker chased her. Just like with me, she said it looked like a twisted human with glowing yellow eyes. She and Dad divorced not long after that, because she wanted to sell the land and leave, but he refused. After all, it's a generational ranch. In 1966, my grandfather had also seen the skinwalker there. They were putting up a new barn on the northeasternmost corner of the ranch, and my grandpa had stayed out late to finish up some of the interior work after the lights were finally installed. He had both barn doors open, with a breeze flowing through the middle of the barn as it was a pretty hot summer night, and he was wanting all the fresh air he could get while hanging the stall doors. As he was working, he felt something creep up beside him, and he thought it was his dog, a German shepherd he had called Martin. He reached out to pet Martin, but he didn't feel him there. So he looked to see where he was. That's when he saw the skinwalker, in the same form me and my mom saw standing in the middle of the barn hallway, staring right at him. He screamed and the skinwalker left, but Grandpa searched all over the ranch and never did find Martin. Years later, we'd find a dog skeleton laid out in the field. The bones were all broken up like something had eaten it. In 1947, my great-grandmother Iris was hanging clothes in the backyard at the ranch when her dog Maddie went barking and howling at something over the horizon. When she looked out to see what the dog was barking at, it was a great big bear, not something a person would expect to see out here in New Mexico. She called the dogs and the kids and they ran inside, and she watched as the bear crept up closer to the house. They didn't have a telephone, so she couldn't call for help. She sent the kids to hide under their beds, and she pushed a hope chest against the door, hoping to keep the bear out. She heard the thing grunting and circling the house, pawing at the sides and scratching the glass at the windows but she curled up in a ball and hid under the shelves in the pantry until the noise stopped and it left. Afterwards, when her husband got home, they took a walk outside together to check on the damage. There wasn't a whole lot, but they found something even more startling. At one point while circling the house, the bear's footprints began to change. By the time it left the homestead and took off back over the hill, the bear's prints had turned into almost human-like tracks with elongated fingers and toes, and a sharp claw poking holes in the ground at the end of each. The first reported sighting of a skinwalker in my family, though, was when my great-grandfather first bought the land in 1919. He saw it many, many times. He built the original house by hand and camped out in the tent on the land every night until the house was built. In his journal, he wrote about the skinwalker circling his camp often at night watching the glow of the fire from a distance. He made peace with the skinwalker by leaving offerings of meat out for it at the top of the hill at the end of the valley. 
and every time the ranch has changed hands throughout its years, it comes with a warning about the skinwalker being there. Now, after what happened with the cow, my family is wanting to leave, but it's a generational ranch. Just like my dad, I can't bring myself to give it up so easily. All I can do is teach my kids about the skinwalker that lives here and how to protect themselves when it's their turn to face it down. I never used to believe that our dreams meant anything. I always thought people who kept dream diaries or who tried to apply hidden meanings to them were a bit on the crazy side. But I'm not sure how I feel anymore. About 10 years ago, my family was going through a personal crisis. I was about 25 at the time, and my younger brother was utterly possessed by drug addiction. He had been arrested a few times and even stole from my parents and from other family members. My mother refused to kick him out of the house, but she made him attend this 60-day inpatient rehab in the city. I had a friend who worked there, and she promised to keep an eye on him. The first few weeks were great, and my brother started gaining weight and would even laugh and joke around with us when we went to visit on Sundays. There was still a lot of hurt to mend, but that could wait for the future. We were all feeling hopeful and just wanted my brother to be okay. Right around the third week my brother had been in rehab, I started having kind of a reoccurring dream. A man I have never met nor remember seeing would be walking down the street. He had shoulder-length curly brown hair and these green eyes behind a pair of thick rim glasses. His mouth was always in sort of a semi-smile, but not a smirk, almost like he was completely content with wherever he was in the world. Even though he was only walking, I could never catch up to him. After a while, he would always turn and look at me, and then that's it. I would wake up every time he would look at me. Like I said, I didn't really buy into any of that spiritual stuff and just figured out he was some guy in a TV show I watched or that I just can't remember. After about a week of having these dreams, I got a call from my friend down at the rehab. She told me that in the middle of the night, my brother had signed himself out. He wasn't court-ordered and my parents, against my advice, had left a little cash with him in case he needed toiletries or something. I had a good idea of where he was going, Kensington, North Philadelphia. It's an incredibly open-air market for what he wanted. I considered leaving him to his fate, but he was my brother, and despite how angry and hurt I was, I loved him, so I went looking for him. I had a picture of him, but I didn't really think it would be of any use. Still, I tried. I walked around for hours showing the pictures to passerbys and pretty much waiting to get beat up or robbed at any moment. I walked for hours and hours. It was getting late and as desperate as I was, I knew that staying after dark would be guaranteed trouble. I started heading back towards the bus stop when I thought I recognized someone standing at the end of the street. It was the man from my dreams. He stared at me for a few seconds with that slight smile on his face. And then he turned and walked around the corner. I sprinted to catch up to him, momentarily forgetting about my brother. When I rounded the corner, I saw that he was already at the next block and turning again. There was no way, not even if I ran, that he could have made it that far. I kept running after him. Some of the other people on the sidewalk were yelling curses at me. We played that cat and mouse game for several blocks and he turned a few more times. Finally, as I came speeding around another corner, I saw him standing in front of an alleyway. He turned to look at me, and then he walked down it. I trotted over to the head of the alley and peered down. The alley ended in this dead-end brick wall, and the guy was nowhere to be seen. Only a bunch of garbage and a dumpster. And that's when I noticed a pair of legs sticking out from behind the dumpster. Thinking it was the guy... I rushed over with a bald fist, but it was my brother. He was unconscious. I tried to slap him awake, but he wasn't responding. I pulled out my phone and called 911. Due to the sheer number of overdoses in the area, there were a lot of emergency response teams nearby. They got there in a few minutes and shot my brother full of Narcan and rushed him to the hospital. He survived, and not only that, The incident was enough to actually knock some sense into him. He's still clean to this day and owns a successful landscaping business. 
I wouldn't dream about the man for another 10 years. I became a dad recently to a little baby boy. The pregnancy was pretty rough on my wife, and we had a few scares, but in the end, we were blessed with a new addition to our family. Sleep, when it came, was restless, and over the last two weeks, I started dreaming about that man again. This time, he was just standing there, right in front of me, but at a weird angle, almost like I was looking up at him. No matter what I did, I couldn't touch him, and I would always wake up after a while. I chalked it up to bad sleeping or being too preoccupied with my son to give it any real thought. When my son was about two months old, my wife was finally starting to feel like her old self again. We had just laid the baby down for a nap, and my wife wanted to go visit her sister a few minutes away before the baby woke up again and was hungry. She deserved a little time to herself, and I wanted to trim some of the hedges out back, which was going to take 20 minutes tops. I had headphones on connected to the baby monitor, as well as an app on my phone that was connected to video. I could see and hear everything in the room. I was outside, my back turned to the house. I was almost done, maybe about another 10 minutes when I pulled out my phone to check on my son. There was someone standing next to his crib, staring right into the baby camera. It was the man, the same man from the day that I found my brother. In a full panic, I rushed into the house and right into the bedroom. I looked around quickly and I couldn't see him anywhere. Our house isn't that big. It's a single-story ranch. It only took a few seconds to check every other room. I went back into the bedroom to check on the baby, and my gut just dropped to the floor. Somehow, my little boy had wiggled around in his swaddle, and it had come up higher than it should, covering his mouth and nose. I couldn't see it from the camera angle. I frantically pulled it down to his chin and could see that his face had a slightly bluish tint to it. I pulled him out of the crib and placed him onto the bed while simultaneously calling 911 from my cell phone. The person on the phone walked me through what to do while the paramedics came. But even as I followed her steps, my son's color started to return to normal, and he was breathing okay. The paramedics showed up a few minutes later, and still thought we should take him to the hospital, just to be sure. I went with the van and called my wife to tell her what happened. But I was feeling better now because my son wasn't showing any signs of distress. We got to the hospital my wife showing up a few minutes later, and sat right outside the room while the nurses and the doctors checked him out. The doctor eventually came out and confirmed that he was just fine, and no permanent damage had been done. She did tell us, however, that even a couple of minutes longer without breathing, and the result could have been devastating. This happened five days ago, and my son is doing just fine. We got rid of all the swaddles and opted for a sleeping sack instead. I've been doing some research on this stuff, this man or whatever he is. That's how I found your channel. And while I'm still not totally convinced, and I'm sort of starting to believe that there might be entities or spirits in the world, and not all of them are bad. So who or whatever you are, thank you. I've always been open to the strange and paranormal. But recently, I had an experience that was so bizarre, there's no doubt in my mind that it was real. I live in Big Rapids, Michigan. I have this friend Steve who loves to scour the internet for supernatural and conspiracy stuff. One day, he came to my house all excited about something that he found on Reddit. To me, that was already a red flag. He said there's been chatter about a supposedly abandoned underground military bunker in the Huron-Manistee National Forest. I never heard anything like that and just laughed at him, but he tried to talk me into checking it out. I was skeptical, but he showed me the Reddit thread, which even had pictures from the alleged site. Someone posted coordinates and landmarks in case anyone wanted to look for it. Here's the thing. There were also sightings of a strange creature in the area, and people speculated that it was connected to the hidden bunker. I know your listeners are familiar with Dogmen. There's tons of stories on your channel about encounters all over the country. Michigan is actually known for its Dogman sightings. Even in my hometown of Big Rapids. I've heard about it from some time from the old timers, but I've never seen one myself. The creature that people describe sounded a lot like the Dogman. Basically, a werewolf-type creature. 
Steve didn't want to go alone, and I finally gave in, as long as he treated me to an eight-corner all-meaty from Jet's Pizza. The Huron-Manistee National Forests cover nearly 100,000 acres. Steve followed a map, and the coordinates took us up a trail. But then we took a narrower trail and went deep into the woods. I had no idea where we were and began to worry. As we hiked, we heard rustling sounds nearby. I was a little concerned because there's bobcats and bears in the forest, and I'm pretty sure we weren't on any kind of official trail. I swore I smelled something too, like rotting meat and sulfur. It didn't bother Steve, so I kept my mouth shut. Then we heard something else. I don't know exactly what it was, but it sounded like a hyena, which would be crazy. It was fairly close, too. I said we should head back and that this was just a wild goose chase. But Steve insisted we were close and even pointed to a large white pine with carvings in the trunk that he was sure the Redditors mentioned. We finally came upon a small hill that housed a concrete door buried under a bunch of foliage. I couldn't believe it, and Steve had no qualms about rubbing it in my face. Still, I was worried about whatever animal made those weird sounds. Steve was only focused on one thing as he pulled open the door and went inside. I reluctantly followed. We used the flashlights on our phones to look around. It was mostly empty, except for some old beer cans. From the outside, you wouldn't be able to tell how big the place was. But as we went further, I realized it was a sprawling complex. There were several rooms, some with old dusty tables and cabinets and gurneys. It looked like a medical or a research facility. Steve took a lot of pictures. It's clear it hadn't been used in decades, but I couldn't understand how this place stayed a secret all these years. Steve said the Redditors thought the military did some kind of secret experiments during World War II. I would have laughed before, but at that point, I thought anything was possible. He was intent on finding something that would prove those theories. But outside of some old rusted equipment, there was nothing. I was hesitant to go any further, as the place was a large labyrinth. Steve made fun of me, but then we heard noises somewhere up ahead. It was the sound of clattering metal, like someone was knocking things over. I grabbed Steve and tried to head back, but he shook me loose and called out to whoever it was, taunting them. I thought he was nuts. Then we heard it, that hyena sound echoing in the concrete maze. It grew louder, and for the first time that day, Steve gave pause. That's when we saw it. At the end of this long corridor, a massive figure emerged. The flashlight wasn't strong enough to get a good look, but it was definitely an animal, prowling on all fours. It was huge, with stringy black fur and this wolf-like face. Steve took a picture, and when it flashed, a hyena laugh erupted from its throat as it stood up on its hind legs. That's when we saw that its upper body was actually human-like, with arms that put Dwayne the Rock Johnson to shame. This thing was huge, maybe seven feet tall. Steve screamed and we both turned and ran. We heard the creature galloping behind us, closer and closer. We finally made it to the entrance, slammed the door shut, and kept going down the narrow trail. As we ran, we heard that hyena sound again, and something in the bushes behind us. Who knows if it was the same creature from the bunker, or another one. We finally made it to the main trail, but we kept going until we got to the car. Nothing followed us. We stood there in silence for a few minutes as we caught our breath. I had a hard time processing what just happened, but Steve burst into a wide grin. He was excited about what we saw, and that he had proof to prove those conspiracies. Then the color drained from his face as he searched for his phone with all the pictures. It was gone. He probably dropped it somewhere in the bunker or the forest. I told him there's no way in hell we're going back. He got angry at me and demanded to know why I hadn't taken any pictures. All I could do was shrug. I got an earful from him as we got into the car and drove back. He kept his word, though. I enjoyed the pizza from Jets. 
Turns out, I worked up an appetite after almost getting attacked by a dog man. A week later, Steve told me that the Reddit thread had been deleted. He thought our encounter had something to do with it, like maybe the military was still watching that place. I thought it was for the better. No one should be snooping around there anyways. I grew up around Point Pleasant. As a kid, the Mothman was ubiquitous. Everyone had a story. Relatives, neighbors, friends, brothers, roommates, you get the idea. Just hearing about it always gave me the chills. My parents divorced when I was young, and me and my mom eventually moved out of Point Pleasant. I was an only child and I'd spent summers with my dad. I loved him, but I didn't feel like I was that connected with him back then. He used to take me camping a lot. He was an outdoorsman and he loved introducing me to the beauty of nature. It was okay, but honestly, I would have rather watched movies or played video games. During one of our trips, I wandered from our site to gather wood for a fire. The sun had already gone down and it was getting pretty dark. I wandered a bit too far, and as I looked around, I didn't see my dad or our tent. That's when I heard this strange clicking sound coming from up in the trees. I looked up and froze, dropping the sticks in my hands. A shadowy figure was perched high in the branches, maybe about 20 feet up. Two glowing red eyes pierced the darkness, staring right at me. They were big and round, and I remember being held under their spell, like I was hypnotized or something. I was convinced it was the Mothman. The branches creaked as the creature stood up and spread its massive wings. It swooped down from the tree, shrieking. I ducked and covered my eyes and felt this gust of wind as it skimmed over me. I stayed curled up in a ball, screaming, until I felt my dad pick me up and hug me. I said it was the Mothman as I sobbed uncontrollably. He calmed me down and we walked back to our tent where he cooked us dinner of hot dogs and canned beans. We ate in silence, and he could tell that I was still bothered by the experience. We heard an owl in the trees, and he said a lot of times owls are mistaken for the Mothman. He took out a flashlight and shined it around the trees, trying to find the owl. Sure enough, he caught it and its eyes reflected this orange-red glow. The owl flew off after being identified, but I was sure the creature I saw was much bigger. I asked him what the Mothman was. He thought for a moment, then he said, it was a force of nature that we just don't understand. But it shouldn't be feared. Instead, it should be revered and respected. I never heard of the Mothman described that way, and I asked him if, he ever saw it himself. He paused thoughtfully, smiled, and shook his head no. Normally after dinner, we'd stargaze and my dad would point out the constellations, but I just went into the tent and tried to go to sleep. That night, I had a horrible dream with a vivid imagery of fire, broken glass, and twisted metal. At the time, I had no idea what it meant, but it was so real. I woke up screaming. Once again, my dad had to calm me down. When I told him about my dream, he gave me a strange look. We weren't scheduled to leave until the following afternoon, but I was so unnerved I begged him to go home early. My dad was a good sport and didn't complain. As we packed up our stuff, I felt guilty and apologized for ruining the trip. He reassured me that everything would be okay and that we'd make up for it with a movie night. As soon as we got onto Route 62, I felt much better. The next day, we were watching TV in the afternoon, and a breaking news story interrupted the program. Apparently, there was a major pileup on Route 62, after a big rig overturned. Several cars were involved, and there were fatalities. It stopped traffic in both directions for hours. My dad commented that it happened on the same route that we took home. If we stuck to our schedule and left the campground when we were originally supposed to, we very well could have been involved in that accident. He continued watching the news in silence before finally turning to me and admitting that he did see the Mothman once when he was in high school. At least he thought he did. He and some friends were driving along Route 62 one night. They were drag racing. 
He knew it was a stupid thing to do, but they were just teenagers. Suddenly, a winged creature started following them. No matter how fast they drove, it easily kept up. He said it was dark and that he couldn't make out its features, but he never forgot its large glowing eyes. He and his friends slowed down and the creature disappeared. That night, he had a dream exactly like the one I had. He thought it was a warning and vowed never to race again. Unfortunately, his friend died in a car wreck a few weeks later while drag racing. One of the things that you hear about the Mothman is that he brings doom. Like the infamous Silver Bridge collapse in 1967, that more or less introduced him. While some blamed him for that event and other tragedies over the years, my dad believed that the Mothman was just an omen. How you interpret it is entirely up to you. I know some will say he's evil personified, a servant of the devil or something like that. I don't think he's good or evil. He just is. He doesn't pick sides. But if you see him, set aside your fear and pay attention to what he's trying to tell you. I don't know what I actually saw that night in the forest. It was dark and my overactive kid imagination immediately saw a monster. But like my dad said, and even proved, it could have been an owl. I can't help but think that the sighting in my dreams were the Mothman trying to warn me, just like he warned my dad. I wondered how many other people he appeared to and how many of them listened. The relationship between me and my dad changed that summer. We became closer. I guess sharing bizarre experiences will do that. I haven't seen the Mothman since, but I haven't been afraid either. My dad is old now, and we don't go camping like we used to, but I cherish every moment with him. In some way, the Mothman taught me that. Life is fleeting, and never take it for granted. Hey Donovan, the stories on your channel always intrigue me. People have had some pretty crazy experiences. I'm especially drawn to the ones in our great country's national parks. In the vast wilderness, mountains, and deserts, there's bound to be things hidden that we're just unaware of. I can attest to this and would like to share my story. I'm a ranger at the Porcupine Mountain Wilderness State Park, also known as the Porkies off the shores of Lake Superior, Michigan. It was recently ranked the best state park in the country, even beating out parks in Hawaii. Its beauty is breathtaking. My favorite time of the year is fall because of the fiery autumn colors. It's home to picturesque lakes and hiking trails and rivers and waterfalls, even an abandoned mine and a ghost town. In the winter, the skiing is incredible. It's the biggest state park in Michigan and home to a lot of wildlife, such as black bears, white-tailed deers, timber wolves, and moose. But sometimes you hear stories of other more mysterious things that lurk in the Porkies. Believe it or not, Lake Superior has its very own resident lake monster, known as Pessy. And while I do have a story about that, I'll save it for another day. This story is about something else that resides in the woods. One summer, we received reports of vandalism at the abandoned copper mine in Ghost Town, which is in more of a remote area of the park. There's a trail to the falls that passes by many of the old mine ruins and abandoned shafts. These are fenced off with signs due to heavy safety and preservation concerns. I was sent to check it out and was surprised to see one of the mine shaft structures pretty badly damaged. The strange thing was, it looked like something burst out from the inside of the shaft with rocks and rubble scattered about. As I looked around, I made out what appeared to be large footprints in the dirt, leading to the surrounding woods. Once in a while, we do get reports of Sasquatch sightings, but they always turn out to be nothing. At the time, I had trouble believing this could actually be a Sasquatch, but I took pictures of the prints and reported it to my supervisor. Against my better judgment, I followed the footprints to see where they went, but the further I went into the woods, the more obscure they became. I was able to make out some broken branches and other telltale signs of something lumbering through here, but then I caught a whiff of this horrible stench, 
like rotting meat. I kept going deeper into the woods and finally came across a carcass of a bear. It looked like it had been dead for only a few days. It was partially eaten, but what made me nervous was that the bear was torn apart with a ferocity that I had never seen before. I couldn't imagine what could possibly do that to a bear, but it had to be massive and powerful. I finally decided it was time to get out of there. As I hustled back to the main trail, I was assaulted by another pungent stench, even worse than the carcass. It was the overwhelming smell of urine, wet dog, and sulfur. Then I heard this strange whooping sound nearby. Just thinking about it as I write this sends chills up my spine. It didn't sound like any animal I was familiar with. Something about it was just so primal. I quickened my pace and finally got to the trail in the ruins. I stopped for a moment to catch my breath, but I was suddenly pelted with rocks, and it was coming from somewhere in the trees, but I couldn't see who or what was doing it. I heard that sound again, closer this time, and I took off as fast as I could. Whatever it was didn't seem to follow me, but it didn't stop until I got back to my truck. I raced to the ranger station and reported everything to my supervisor and showed him the pictures. He listened but didn't say a word, and I couldn't tell if he believed me or not. Together, we looked at trail cam footage in that area, and while we didn't see anything definitive, we did see a large figure covered in hair lurking in the foliage. It was too broad and humanoid to be a bear. My supervisor grabbed copies of the pictures from my phone but then he told me to delete them immediately. I was confused, but he insisted I do it right in front of him. He was serious, and for my own job security, I did what I was told. He said not to tell anyone about it for the time being. The next day, he calls me into his office and reiterates that, that the DNT Parks and Recreation wanted to keep the situation quiet, as they didn't want to scare tourists and visitors unnecessarily. I reminded him of the mutilated bear carcass and said that it might actually be necessary after all. He just told me that it would be handled and we were to stay out of it. Camping areas and hiking trails around the falls, the Little Iron River, and Lost Creek were temporarily closed. I noticed some military vehicles driving into the area with armed men dressed in camo. At first, I thought it was the National Guard but there were no markings on the vehicles or their uniforms. I tried to follow them, but I was immediately stopped and told to stay away. A few days later, my supervisor informed me that the situation was resolved, whatever that meant, and the camping areas and hiking trails were reopened. I went back to the old mine ruins and was surprised to see that the destroyed mine shaft structure had been rebuilt, a bit haphazard but close enough to the way it was before. The creature was never seen again. I don't know what happened to it, but I shudder to think what those armed men might have done. Who knows where it actually came from, but maybe it lived in the abandoned mines. I couldn't help but to think that maybe there were more of them down there and that one day they could rise up again. That sounds crazy, I know. I kept a vigilant watch in that area ever since, but thankfully... We haven't had any issues, not yet at least. I worked in a national park for a few years in the southwest. I don't really want to say the name of the park on here, but it's a pretty famous one, so you've most likely heard of it. I worked at one of the many information stations we had around the park. Mostly it involved handing out maps, explaining trails, and checking in guests for guided tours. Sometimes, I got to give small tours and host educational talks about the history of the area and our local wildlife. We tended to hire quite a few seasonal staff during the busy season to keep things running smoothly. We didn't have as many visitors in the winter, so we could run on a skeleton staff. Typically, the trails would get some snow in December, January, and February. It's not usually much, but it's enough to make the trails icy and extremely dangerous. The unfortunate part about working the winter season with the skeleton crew was that we all had to do a little bit of everything. 
One day, I had been tasked to restock the cafeteria display in the main lodge. We don't offer room service or meals like a hotel, but we do have a cafeteria where our guests can purchase pre-made food. I would have to get up at 4 a.m. to have the display stock before it opened. Now, I'm not much of a morning person, so I asked my supervisor if I could do it at night instead. I had the keys to the building and planned to go there after everything was shut down for the day. My supervisor was one of the lead rangers at the park. He said he didn't care when I got the cafeteria done, just that it was done before 6 a.m. I took this to mean that he knew I would be doing it at night, but judging by what happened later that night, he definitely forgot I was going to be there. I'll admit, I did start quite a bit later than I had planned. It was nearly 11 p.m. by the time I started restocking. I know that sounds pretty late, but I'm a night owl, and it was sort of nice to be able to work without anyone else there. I was only about 20 minutes into my task when I heard the cafeteria door open. I was in the back of the kitchen, but it was a heavy door, and there was no mistaking it. I knew only someone with a set of keys could be in here, so I knew it was one of my co-workers. I was about to check who it was when I heard my supervisor's voice. It sounded like he was talking on the phone. I heard him walk to the counter and grab something. It sounded like a yogurt cup, but that's really not important. I was still behind the kitchen door, but he was close enough that I could hear half of his phone conversation. It might be important for me to say that the cafeteria lights are always on at the front of the counter, even through the night. So, he truly had no idea I was back there. I thought I should just probably walk out with an armful of food for the counter, so he would know that he wasn't alone. But then he started talking about some strange things, so I stayed back. He was talking about footprints on one of the main trails in the canyon. Bare footprints, as in without shoes. In December, there was a light dusting of snow on the ground so any strange footprints should have been pretty easy to follow. I know there are some crazy hikers out there, but no way is someone hiking without shoes in this type of weather. At this point, I'm thinking that they're talking about a missing hiker, and we hadn't had any reports of missing hikers lately. But then my supervisor said something odd. He said, It's best to leave it well enough alone. It doesn't want to harm anyone. It? That was the word that stuck out to me. He wouldn't have described an animal as being barefoot. And he wouldn't have called a person it. I didn't know what to think. I scooted closer to the kitchen door so I could hear better. The conversation sounded pretty tense. They weren't arguing, but they were close to it. My supervisor told the other person that their services weren't needed and that no one has had any negative encounter with the creature yet. Things got a little heated, and I couldn't hear everything that was said but I do remember exactly what my supervisor said before he hung up the phone. He said, If you want to hunt it, go ahead, but you'll never find it, even with a fresh trail. A lot of people have tried. I waited until I heard the front door open and close before I stuck my head out of the kitchen. I definitely wasn't supposed to hear that conversation, but I had to know what they were talking about. However, I was left with more questions than answers. I wasn't able to put the story together until the following day at lunch when I was talking to one of my co-workers who had been working the morning shift in the cafeteria. She told me that a hiker had stopped to talk to her a bit. He was heading out a couple of days early because of the trail conditions. He tried to hike into the canyon but had to turn back and on his route back, he saw some footprints in the snow. Bare human footprints. He said he reported it to the ranger station and called the non-emergency police line and asked if there were any reports of missing people in the area, because the rangers weren't taking him seriously. He asked my co-worker if she heard anyone that has gone missing. The hiker was convinced that there was someone out there wandering around the canyon without shoes. I didn't know what to think. I still don't know what to think. I haven't seen any strange creatures in the park myself, but from the little bits of information I overheard, I don't think these things want to be seen. I couldn't tell you what they look like, just that they have human feet, and according to my supervisor, they don't pose a threat to people, but I know there's something out there. My buddy Mark is a paleontologist for real. 
like one of those dudes you see in the movies. Anyway, once he had a fossil hunting expedition planned, and his usual group couldn't make it, so he asked me to go with him. Now, I don't know anything about it, but he promised to train me and feed me, so I agreed. We went in his Ford expedition out to this secret location in the Badlands. I assumed he had permission to go on this land, but I didn't really ask. He had his two-person tent in the back and a bunch of Dinty Moore beef stew, which isn't my idea of provisions, but I wasn't in charge of this thing. When we got there, it was late morning, but already hot. He gave me a hat and we started poking around in this big dry area of dirt and patches of grass. Part of it was a canyon, so it was like being inside a huge bowl. I got bored after about 20 minutes of watching him poke around, and I saw some strange tracks in the dirt that looked fresh. I asked him what he thought they were, and he said maybe a bird or something. It would have had to be a monster bird, though, because those tracks were as big as my feet. I followed them until they disappeared out of the canyons, just because I was bored. They seemed to go in a grassy place, and then off into a group of trees. I started googling on my phone and I couldn't find any tracks that looked like the ones I found, at least not that size. It sounds crazy, but they look most like chicken feet. Three toes with, in this case, huge claws. I asked Mark if he thought it might be a dinosaur and he looked at me and told me to go drink some water. I did that and thought about the dinosaur idea. Thing is, this monster seemed to be walking on two legs. Finally, it got too dark to look anymore. I was starving, and even Dinty Moore sounded good. Mark got a fire going and heated up a couple of cans while I put up the tent. I forgot how bad I sleep in tents. Even though I was tired as heck from the day wandering around the canyon, I still couldn't sleep. I kept thinking I was hearing something walking around the outside of the tent, and I also couldn't stop thinking about those tracks. I guess I finally got to sleep, though, because the next thing I knew, I smelled coffee. I went outside, and Mark had another fire going, and he made a pot of coffee and some box-mixed pancakes. I wanted to use a bathroom before I ate, but, of course, there was no bathroom out there. I went behind the tent and freaked out because I saw a ton of those tracks right at the back of the tent, like the thing had been pacing around there all night. Now, Mark had to be worried, I thought, so I brought him around the tent and showed him the tracks. He repeated that it had to be a bird. I put my foot next to the track to show him how big it was. I guess ostriches might have feet that big, but wouldn't we notice ostriches out here? Mark didn't have any theories, and he really wasn't that interested. He just wanted to look for fossils, which was pretty crazy to me. Why all the excitement about ancient dead creatures when we have a living one right around here? I was curious, but I wasn't scared until that night. I slept even worse than the night before, but Mark was out like a light. I got bored lying there trying to sleep, so I went outside and got another fire going. The fire made some crackling noises, but over it I heard something walking around. Not around, I realized, but toward me. A few seconds later, I saw it. I thought at first it was just a trick of the firelight, because what I was seeing was a dinosaur thing standing upright, staring at me with these piercing yellow eyes. It looked like it was covered in snake-like scales. It had a snake or dinosaur, or maybe like a lizard head. It kept coming toward me. I wanted to scream, but, but I was afraid if I did... Mark would come out of the tent and this thing would get both of us. I didn't know what to do, honestly. I ran around to the other side of the fire, thinking that it might throw the thing off and at least give me a few seconds to think. I couldn't just run because who knew if I'd be faster, and I couldn't get in the car and leave Mark. While I was thinking, the thing was coming around the fire slowly. I couldn't figure out why it just didn't attack and get it over with. Reptiles are fast. It could have eaten me by now. I decided that it was scared of the fire. At least, I hoped it was. I grabbed a stick that was on fire. I didn't even care if I burned myself at that point. It was better than dying. I ran at the thing like a crazy person waving that stick around, figuring I had nothing to lose. It worked. The thing started to back away and finally turned and ran up the ridge. Once my heart stopped pounding, I realized I had no way to convince Mark to leave. 
I wish I'd gotten a picture of the thing so he knew I wasn't crazy. I sat by the fire until morning and it didn't come back. When the sun came up, I made coffee and breakfast and told Mark we had to go. I don't think he believed my story, but he agreed. Probably because he'd found a good number of fossils anyway. I told him he shouldn't come back here again, at least not at night, but I doubt he'll ever listen to me.